Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the forum at St. Bart's. My name is Peter Thompson. I'm the Associate Rector for Formation and Liturgy here, and it is my joy to welcome you to this discussion of Frederick Douglass and his famous 4th of July speech, um, one of the greatest speeches certainly in Douglass's life, but also one of the greatest speeches in American history. And we are very fortunate to have with us for this discussion, David Blight, who last year won the Pulitzer Prize for his biography of Douglass, Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom. He is the Sterling Professor of History of African American Studies and American Studies at Yale. And he's also the director of the Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance and Abolition there. Professor Blight, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you, Peter. It's an honor to be here with you at St. Bart's. So um, many folks are familiar with this speech, especially we were talking um, before this about how it's, um, it, its prominence has increased over the past few years and this year specifically, but, but many folks are unfamiliar. Can you, can you give us the background of this speech? Um, how um, was Douglas asked to deliver it? Where did this fit in um, Douglas's career? And, and what were the major points? Oh, sure. Uh, the context tells us a great deal. It's the summer of 1852. It's two years after the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act, the hated Fugitive Slave Act among, in the anti-slavery community and among free blacks across the North. Um, and indeed, at that point, there have been many fugitive slave rescues that have occurred across the North, some of which Douglas himself has actually participated in. Uh, the context is also that that spring, Uncle Tom's Cabin had just been published and it was taking the country and frankly the world by storm. Whatever one thinks of that novel, that sentimentalized uh, layered story of slavery, it affected the slavery crisis like no other book. It's also an election year. It's a big presidential election year, 1852. The political parties in America are beginning to tear themselves apart. The Whig Party, the Democratic Party, they're uh, they're being greatly influenced and challenged by the nativist Know Nothing Party and the Free Soil Party. So Douglas knows when he's invited uh, that there is a huge political context here for the slavery crisis. Now he's invited essentially by his friends in Rochester, New York. He's invited by the Ladies Anti-Slavery Society of Rochester. And he was invited to speak in what at that point was a quite new hall, a beautiful hall that had just been built about two years before called Corinthian Hall. And he had about 600 people in the audience that day. And there is a letter in which Douglas tells us that he worked for some three weeks on this speech, on and off. Uh, he, in fact, he said, I worked harder on this speech than anything else I've ever written. And it showed. Um, we can come back to the rhetoric here in a moment, if you like, because it is, it was and is uh, the rhetorical masterpiece of American abolitionism, and in some ways, one of the, one of the great works of, of oratorical rhetoric ever done by an American. Yeah, he, he makes some very uh, interesting rhetorical moves um, oh. in making his point. Um, he he starts he out by, by praising American independence, and um, then he, he uses that, that pronoun your um, mm -hmm. to, to create that, to mm -hmm. um, emphasize that distance between oh. him as the speaker, and then, and then he really goes for it. Do you want to talk a bit about his rhetorical moves? Uh, sure. I, I have often tried to liken this speech, and I do so in my biography, to a symphony in three movements. It, it is rhetoric as music. Language is music. Uh, the first movement is, as you say, this opening. It's relatively short, maybe six, five, six pages of text, uh, where he sets his audience at ease. He celebrates the 4th of July with them. Uh, he honors the founding fathers. He calls them geniuses. He especially honors the principles of the Declaration of Independence, the four first principles, equality, popular sovereignty, uh, the right of revolution, uh, and, uh, and, the, and, and on. <clears throat> but what he's really doing there is setting them up. In fact, he calls those principles the saving principles. He calls the 4th of July, the American Passover. 
this is classic secular civil religion, then it becomes much more Christian and religious by uses, especially of the Old Testament. He even calls the Declaration of Independence twice in the speech. He calls it the ring bolt of your liberty, the ring bolt that if you, if you let it go, everything will go. But then about five, six pages in, as you say, he begins to rain down the pronouns, you and your and you and your, it's yours, not mine. And then the hammer comes down. He says, pardon me. Why have you invited me here on the 4th of July? The 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I must mourn. Why would you invite me into your temple of liberty? He's making that distance. He's declaring that distance between African-Americans, especially slaves and former slaves, with America's independence. And then, the, and then the middle movement of the symphony, the long movement, 10, 11 pages, is a litany of the horrors of the African slave trade, the holds of the slave ships, the auction blocks in America, the domestic slave trade in America, all of the kind of hideous pain and suffering that slavery has wrecked on people and on the nation becomes this middle section, which probably lasted a good 20 minutes. And it, I've sometimes likened it to like a hailstorm. He's just raining hail down on his audience. He's making them hurt. He's kind of tearing their heart out just before he's going to try to give it back to them. Mm -hmm. And that middle movement ends with, a, it's, 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 it's like Jonathan Edwards uh, centers in the hands of an angry God. In fact, it's almost Jonathan Edwards done one better. He says, he says, beware, beware, there is a horrible reptile curled up at your nation's heart about to eat it out. Break away, he says, cast it away um before it eats out your heart and that becomes the ending now of the middle movement the middle section of the speech and there's a pause in the language you can you can feel it it's almost as though he steps back gives a pause maybe he passed out some towels so they could dry off from the hailstorm <laughs> And then the last little section of the speech it's just oh maybe four pages or so uh, the third movement, he lets them up. He says, well, but your nation is still young and it's still malleable. That's the word he uses, which means changeable. It's not quite too late. You may yet still save yourselves. And then quite almost miraculously, he ends by reciting several verses from a poem by William Lloyd Garrison. Uh, his mentor in the abolition movement with whom he has just had a terrible breakup, personal and ideological breakup in 1850, 51, uh, which is what makes it so remarkable that he would use a passage of a verse by Garrison. And that verse is called, Go Sound the Jubilee, which is, of course, a biblical term for liberation. Now, there are many other elements of this speech. Uh, both in the ways he draws off the secular enlightenment, the Declaration of Independence, but also the, the speech is laced with biblical language, biblical imagery. And my own favorite moment in the speech is right after he says, my fellow Americans, you know, what we need now is sacrilegious irony. And then he just floats, he doesn't name his text. He almost never did that. Because in the 19th century, the assumption was often for abolitionist audiences, you didn't have to name your biblical text. You just did it. He doesn't name his text. He just floats into the 137th Psalm. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. You made us hang our harps upon the willows, and you demanded of us a song. It's Douglas saying to the audience, you invited me here to sing for you as a captive, I'm still a captive. And of course that word captive is in the 137th Psalm. Um, he said, in effect, he's saying, I'm not gonna sing for you. I'm gonna tear your hearts out. I'm gonna give you one of the most blistering Jeremiah ads you've ever encountered. I'm gonna tell you of your hypocrisy and I'm gonna tell you it's almost too late. It's a, it's a classic uh, 
altar call. Come to your senses, come back to your creeds, come back to your promises and live up to them. And there's also about, is at least two, ish, two uses of Isaiah in this speech, it, which is very typical of Douglas, by the way. Uh, almost every Douglas speech has some either direct passage, especially from the Hebrew prophets, or allusions from the prophets, or language from the prophets. Sometimes you just throw off a line, no rest for the wicked. Well, we know that's from Isaiah, and there are different uses of it, but, but he, had, he had phrases from uh, the King James Bible just embedded in his head that would just pop out of him at times. However, one last little thing here people should know. This speech, like all major, Douglas's, ma ma major speeches by Douglas, were written out in text form. He wrote his speeches. Uh, he, he wasn't just that, that preacher who could go up on a stage and blast out the lights off the top of his head. I mean, he could do some of that too, but he wrote these speeches down and he had this baby already printed up. <laughs> to sell. He did. He yeah. had it ready to take out on the road. And in the next issue of his newspaper, it was advertised for, I forget now, was it 50 cents a copy? And you could get for 10 or $15, a hundred copies. He was ready to go. He, our man was a marketer, you know, and hardly the first to do that. The abolitionists had to do that. Um, so um, it, 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 it's rhetoric alone makes it worth reading. But then when you, you understand the, the nature of the slavery crisis there in the early 1850s, uh, the kind of desperation in a lot of abolitionist communities and free black communities, especially because of that Fugitive Slave Act, um, the speech just takes on that much more meaning. I wonder if we can talk a little more about the homiletical nature of the sure. speech. Um, as a preacher, it definitely comes across like a sermon. And um, in the following the Hebrew prophets, and you, you, you write a lot about this in your book, he knows his Hebrew prophets, he draws on them a lot, but he, he critiques institutional religion. He, oh, yeah. um, he, has, he doesn't have kind words for um, American Christianity, um, which he believes has sometimes colluded with the oppressor or at least stayed silent in the face of the oppressor. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about his relationship to institutionalized Christianity. I know that abolitionism was anti-clerical a lot of the time, although he got his start preaching sermons. So I'm oh, yeah. um, curious about your, your thoughts about his relationship with institutional Christianity. Well, and that is the Jeremiah tradition, isn't it? Yep. it? It's calling the flock to their creeds. It's calling them back. It's, it's the chastisement of collective sin. Uh, he cut his teeth as an orator, well, as a preacher first in a little AME church in New Bedford, Massachusetts. And then as he was discovered and invited out on the lecture circuit, the anti-slavery lecture circuit from 1841 to 1844, 445, his most prominent speech uh, or variations of it was what became known as the slaveholder's sermon, where he would go into, he was, he was even, even when he was so young, only in his 20s, he was a great mimic. He would go into these performances where he would perform as a, as a preacher in the South, you know, slaves be loyal to your masters. He'd draw those passages from the Bible that were pro-slavery. And he would give this kind of mock pro-slavery sermon for five or 10 minutes, full of laughter and hilarity and so on and so on. And he would prance around a stage. But his point in that speech, and we have, we have variations of it in text form or in ways people even wrote it down and recorded it, his, his target were pro-slavery clergy and the complicity of some Northern churches, but his target really were the hearts and minds of his auditors. Uh, he's trying to persuade them uh, away from just the sense of personal sin and to this idea of collective sin. Uh, and, and even when he went to England, uh, to Ireland, Scotland, and Britain, he arrived, for example, in Britain just at the time, I'm sorry, in Scotland, just at the time in 1846 that the Scots you know, all those Scots uh, Presbyterians and the Church of Scotland people were having one of their ecclesiastical wars uh, 
and the war was over the divisions in the Church of Scotland over whether they should have raised money in the American South, and they had raised a lot of money from slaveholders. And so he arrives during the midst of this campaign being run by one of the factions, the anti-slavery faction called Send Back the Money, Send Back the Money. And he was perfectly ready for that. You, you, want, you want me to talk about a religious hypocrisy? That's what I've been doing for four years. And he hit the ground running. They loved him. Well, they loved him for various reasons. Uh, but, but he kind of walked right into, you know, a fat pitch that he could hit out of the park any day of the week. But the important thing here, I think, and you just alluded to it, is that Douglas, even while he was a slave, from about the age of 12 on, had been carefully reading the Bible. Now, that doesn't mean you know, he always understood all those Old Testament stories. Who does? Uh, <laughs> but he sat with an old preacher in Baltimore named Charles Lawson, who Douglas tells us about in the autobiographies. And uh, Lawson was a, was a drayman by day, but he was a biblical almost fanatic and he wasn't a great reader and once he found this kid at age 12 13 14 who could read so well douglas tells us they would sit for hours and hours especially on sundays days off from work and just read old test the old testament out loud you know just read out loud uh, i don't know exactly what he read out loud with lawson but try to imagine a 14 year old slave kid with an old black man sitting on his stoop in Baltimore, reading Isaiah, or just reading passages out of the Psalms. That's how Douglas got language in his head. And my dilemma in writing this book, uh, which I think you're aware of, was I, for a long time I was uncomfortable using the word prophet with Douglas. I just, you know, it's a big word, as you well know. <laughs> It's a very big word, and you can't just throw it around easily. This is prophetic, and that's prophetic. We kind of overuse it sometimes. But I have good friends who are theologians, two or three of them, and they helped me. They got me reading this and reading that. They, uh, my dear friend Don Shriver at uh, Union Theological uh, told me, you need to read Walter Brueggemann on the Old Testament. And my, my friend here in New Haven, Jim Ponent, who is a rabbi, uh, said, all right, David, you got to read Abraham Heschel. And I started reading Heschel. And uh, Heschel is the great Jewish theologian, mid 20th century, wrote many books about the Hebrew prophets. But it was there that I began to get definitions of what a prophet actually is. And so many of them fit Douglas so closely. It was Heschel who said, I can almost, I can quote it now almost verbatim. I don't need to look at my notes anymore. Heschel said the true prophet is that person who can hear words or, and speak words one octave higher than the rest of us, who can find the language in a crisis, you know, in a world historical crisis, in a catastrophe, in a triumph. Uh, they can find the words to explain to us what we're experiencing where most of us cannot find those words. Heschel also said things like, a true prophet has probably been shattered by something in his or her life in order to now shatter us. Mm -hmm. And there you think of uh, prophets like Jeremiah, and then you think of somebody like a Douglas. And this is the, the, I think, most single most important thing about Frederick Douglass. It is his capacity, his power, with language, his power with words, his power to explain uh, what race, slavery, civil war, and all the rest meant in America. There's really no other voice quite like him in the 19th century. And back to the 4th of July speech, anyone who reads that carefully with a Bible near them will find six, seven different passages in that speech woven in course, their storytelling power uh, directly out of the Old Testament. I wonder if you can reflect on to what extent this is a patriotic speech. Um, oh, yeah. He, he mm -hmm. spends a lot of time basically exposing the American project in his words as a sham. And yeah. that 
yet that critique is bookended by overtures to the greatness of the American project. And, uh, you know, he starts out extolling the founding fathers. And at the end, he talks about the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution. He calls yeah. the Constitution a glorious liberty document, which is right. fundamentally anti-slavery, which was really striking to me. It, it, I had to wrap my mind around that. Um, well, that moment in particular comes later in the speech, and it reflects, again, context here. He has just converted, well, in 5051, he has just converted to the what was called the anti-slavery interpretation of the Constitution. Until then, for nearly a decade, he had been a loyal follower of William Lloyd Garrison's idea that the U.S. Constitution was so complicitous with slavery in its in its various ways, and of course it is in a lot of ways, yeah. that it was, in Garrison's word, a covenant with death. Hmm. Now, Douglas, by the, or the early 50s, had come under the influence of other abolitionists and other thinkers, William Goodell, Lysander Spooner, and Garrett Smith. These, these men had been uh, the kind of philosophers of an anti-slavery vision of the Constitution, using the Bill of Rights, using the language of building a more perfect union, using the clause in the Constitution that says the federal government is bound to guarantee, quote, a Republican form of government to each state. Now, this was always a, a, a bitter debate among anti-slavery people, but Douglas has come out by then. Basically, he's come to the conclusion that he is tired, as he said, of always being on, on the other side of using law, always on the outside of the Constitution. He said, man, let's get the Constitution on our side. Let's get law on our side, because if we don't, the only choice we have is probably violent revolution. Hmm. Um, but it, 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 uh, it, it, it becomes a fundamental worldview for him now as he's becoming a political abolitionist uh, right at this time that he prepares this speech on the 4th of July. Now, on the patriotism question, it's basically... You know, it, this is an old fashioned idea now, but boy, is it important, especially now with what we're experiencing. You know, can you love your country enough to really criticize it? Do you love your country enough, or at least its principles, to condemn it when it's wrong? Can you separate yourself from practices by belief in principles? And how do you do that? Again, Douglas loved the Declaration of Independence, at least the, the preamble, the, the first principles. Again, equality, popular sovereignty, uh, a right of revolution, um, and above all, the doctrine of natural rights that were born with certain liberties and rights from God or nature. Take your choice. Uh, Douglas believed in America's creeds. He, he said so many times in so many ways, the creeds are great. It's the practices that are terrible. Uh, he once said, I wish I could cite right now where he said it, but he once said, America is its contradictions. Quote, all made up of its contradictions. Now, how often do we find ourselves saying that in our own lifetime now? And we're living one of those moments again when we're being, we're being confronted every day in the face with our contradictions. Here we are, 155 years after emancipation, 150 some years after the 14th and 15th Amendments, uh, 50 and 60 years after the great Civil Rights Acts of the 1960s. And it's as if we have to do it all over again. Well, we do. We had a first reconstruction, we had a second reconstruction, and we may just may be now on the cusp of some kind of new civil rights regime, voting rights regime, equality regime in America that will have to be once again uh, forged in law. Uh, one of the things Douglas learned in his long life and his incredible array of experiences with oppression and racism is that history is never over. It's not over when you win, it's never over when you win, get ready. And it, sh it surely is not over when you lose. Uh, you gotta regroup when you lose. Now that's not easy. 
especially when you have to do it three, four, five, and six times in your own life. Um, but Douglas was an American patriot. In the book, I call him repeatedly a kind of radical patriot, uh, ready to be honest, not just about the flaws. You know, we, we like to say America has a lot of flaws. Well, it does. But it, it's, it's like all other countries. You know, We have as much tragedy in our history as anyone else. It's just that Americans have, all, have grown up believing we're not a people of tragedy. We're not a people. We're, we're people of progress, we think. We always believe that American history is some kind of escalator going up. Um, and oh my goodness, if you don't mind me saying it, did we get treated to that theory the other night by President Trump in front of Mount Rushmore? The version of history he gave us last Friday night, I don't know what to say about it, except that it sounded to me like a very badly constructed version of a third grade textbook uh, that or a 1951 version of patriotic history for sixth graders. Um, you know, th this idea that uh, America was born pure and then just got more pure over time. It's just, it's just a ridiculous vision of history. Uh, no one else claims that for their history, you know, that they were born perfect and then just got more perfect. Uh, no one's that way, really. We, but, but it's the myth that too many Americans still want to live. And I'll take on one other idea real quickly that, that Trump claimed. And it's so offensive for someone like, I've been teaching almost 50 years, started as a high school teacher. I've taught in small liberal arts colleges. I've taught in universities. And that claim that American historians and teachers of history are trying to teach American kids to quote, hate their country, which is what, what the president said, is so offensive to generations of us now who have been trying to teach the country's history from a multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multi-religious, pluralistic point of view, which is our history. Uh, we're not trying to teach anybody to hate anything. We're trying to teach them to understand it. I didn't mean to get so political, but I did, so. <laughs> I, I encourage those of you who have questions for Professor Blight to um, use the live chat function on YouTube or the comments function on Facebook, or you can also email your questions to me at pthompson at stbarts.org, p-t-h-o-m-p-s-o-n at stbarts.org. Um, since you mentioned politics, I wonder if you can reflect a bit on Douglas's um, identity as a political actor. Um, mm. He becomes a part of, like, he becomes a major player in Republican politics, um, especially after the Civil War. And I wonder if you can talk about that. It's one of the most uh, fascinating to me parts of his trajectory. Uh, in the 1850s is when he really learns to become a political abolitionist. He, begin, he, he comes to the realization that if he can't affect real power with the anti-slavery crusade, nothing may ever change. He found it very difficult to shoulder up to the Republican Party at first when it was born in 1854. Uh, it was, it's, its essential reason to be was to stop the expansion of slavery, not necessarily eliminate slavery. That was never enough for Douglas. On the other hand, he found himself increasingly thrilled that there was a major political party attacking slavery. He began to realize, it took time, but he began to realize that an attack on the morality of slavery in the West, in a Western territory, was in a way an attack on slavery everywhere. And again, uh, he, he found it hard sometimes to get close to Republicans, but, but he finally did. And even in 1860, uh, he wanted Lincoln to be elected, there's no question. Although he still had one foot at that point in, in, a, in a group that called themselves the Radical Abolition Party, which elected, I think, one person in upstate New York. Uh, actually, they elected one congressman, Garrett Smith, to one term, but didn't elect much of anybody else. Um, now, in the Civil War, Douglas found, again, difficult shouldering up to the initial policies of the Lincoln administration about fugitive slaves, about making a war against slavery. But once the Emancipation Proclamations came, the preliminary and the final, he changed his tune. 
not only on Lincoln, but on a certain faith that federal power could now be harnessed and was being harnessed through the army and Navy to destroy slavery. And it's what Douglas most wanted. And make no mistake, he became a thumping war propagandist. But what he most wanted, most dreamed of was a sanctioned war to destroy slavery. Now, the fascinating and complicated part comes, as you just suggested, Peter, after the war. Because uh, during Reconstruction, uh, Douglas is a huge supporter of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, although he had wished the 14th and 15th had been more radical. But what happens to Douglas is he's this old radical outsider who had always been outside of power. But by the 1870s, and especially after the Grant years, he gets three appointments in the federal government, Marshal of the District of Columbia, Recorder of Deeds in the District of Columbia, which don't sound like sexy jobs, but they were important. And eventually the United States ambassador to Haiti. So he's this old radical outsider who now becomes a kind of political insider. And the fascinating part is what does an old radical do when he begins to make certain kinds of, you know, compromises? And as he goes, as he grows older and older, there young, there's a younger generation that's going to start attacking him as not radical enough. Uh, and in some ways, he is the prototype in American history, especially for African Americans, as an, the African American radical who gets inside of power to a degree. And what does that do to a person? What does that do to their assumptions? What does that do to their sense of compromise? Uh, I found that part of Douglas's life absolutely fascinating, and I devote a great deal of attention to it in the biography. So we have a question about um, what you think Douglas would say to the white Protestant church of today and its complicity um, around racial injustice. And I maybe would extend that to say, what would Douglas say to American Christianity, to the country as a whole in this moment that we're living in? Not that, not that a historian can, can really know that, but what, what do you think he, he would have to say about this moment? I'll give you a good guess. He was, uh, he was ordained in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Actually, the AME Zion Church is where he was at. And our ordination then meant that, you know, a committee gathered and said, kid, you can preach. You're a preacher. That's basically <laughs> what it was. He didn't, go to, he didn't go to school. But he learned his homiletics by practicing it. He learned how to preach to the text. So it's entirely possible he would come to a, uh, let's just say, a mainstream Protestant convention let's say that, or maybe to a major American church. He would say, look, I grew up in this tradition. I was a Methodist. And he was, by the way. He was a Methodist by assumptions. He was a Methodist by certain practices. And we could even talk about the strains of anti-Catholicism that do come out of Frederick Douglass. He was a Methodist, Protestant. Uh, he might even set everybody at ease by probably uh, drawing on some great biblical text. He'd lay a little Isaiah on people. He'd lay a little Jeremiah on people. He'd probably trot out a psalm or two. And then he would say, the hypocrisy I talked about in the 4th of July speech, it's still here. It's still here. It seems to be an all but permanent American contradiction. And he probably would try to argue that this thing called the American experiment, this, this what he called the composite nation, uh, is uh, unfinished, terribly unfinished, especially if he were around and could see what's happening right now. He would probably even warn against uh, believing that there's an end game. Now, I know that's, that's troublesome in Christianity, or it can be troublesome in Christianity. But he would say, look, uh, history's not, I, I'm, I'm convinced of this. His, Douglas would say, you know, history's not going any particular place. We have to make it go there. Uh, I'm, and I'm, I'm serious that he would, he would meet this tradition where it is because he was part of it. The man, the man was raised around Protestantism. In 19th century America, that's most people. Now, uh, but he would blister 
the problem of complicity or the problem of religious hypocrisy wherever he found it. If he, if he sensed a certain uh, staid or stultified approach to personal religion that was not taking seriously, I guess what we might generally call a social gospel, uh, he'd really go after that uh, because his Christianity was was basically a Christianity, whatever his faith ended up being, which is never easy to discern, but his Christianity was a Christianity of deliverance. It was a Christianity of resistance. It was a Christianity of liberation, of jubilee. Um, and he, he, he allowed himself to believe, he couldn't help it, that somehow that vision, that religious worldview, that conception of a Christian worldview was caught up in America's own secular creeds. The idea of natural rights, you know, you can, you can take your choice here. Are natural rights from God or natural rights from nature, or are they just like precious ore? He once likened natural rights to precious ore. You know, they come from the earth. They belong to everyone. Um, and, 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 and I suspect he would, he would just try to harness Protestantism on the side of just basic human equality. Do you think he would have hope? Oh, yeah. It was, it was almost a standard uh, obligation for Douglas. If you read enough of his speeches, if you read his editorials, or if you read the autobiographies, he would use his own life which is, of course, the self-serving nature of autobiography. Um, and whoa, could he be manipulative in those autobiographies? But yeah, he would. Even in his lynching speech, the last great speech of his life, which he crafted in 1893 at 75 years old, when he had heart disease and he was beginning, to, his hands would shake, he took that baby on the road dozens and dozens of times. They called the speech the Lessons of the Hour. This was in 1893, 1894, after the outbreaks of lynching in the South in the past, at that point, four or five years, 200, 250 lynchings a year. He took that issue on. And he delivered a kind of a three-part analysis of why lynching was happening. And it was very despairing. But even at the end of that speech, it was almost like an obligation to him. He ended on his belief in the natural rights tradition, that no matter how many people are lynched, you cannot kill the natural right of equality, the natural right of the chance to participate in Republican small r forms of government, the natural right uh, to resistance. Um, so, there were despairing moments in his life, make no mistake. And I, you know, I sometimes in lectures have named like four or five, six of them as a way. In fact, I remember the, the day after the 2016 election, uh, you know, without a lot of sleep, I was supposed to speak at noon at the Harvard Law School. And it was a speech, it was a lecture on Douglas. And I, I wasn't sure anyone would show up. And uh, I decided just quickly that morning on the train to choose three despairing moments in Douglas's life and how he responded to them. One was the Dred Scott decision. Another was the 1883 Supreme Court case that obliterated the 14th Amendment. And I'm forgetting what the third one was, but I just thought, I don't know what to do for this audience except go back to some similar crises uh, and try to talk about how Douglas coped, what traditions he drew upon, what beliefs he drew upon, what philosophies he drew upon. Um, and I do think, uh, for him at least, having become this very public spokesman, uh, and we've seen this not only from politicians, but certainly from religious leaders, hope becomes a kind of uh, social obligation, almost. Even though, uh, I mean, if we listen to the, the great public uh, preachers of today, like uh, Reverend William Barber, for example, he can rip your heart out too, but he'll give it back to you. He'll give it back to you in a, in a kind of uh, New Testament hope. 
we have a question about um, Douglas's relationship to and views on Lincoln. And um, I'm very aware that at the beginning of your book, you talk about the Emancipation Memorial. And as I was reading that section, I was also aware that folks really want to take that memorial down now in DC. Oh, yeah. I was wondering if you can uh, reflect on, on Douglas's thoughts about Lincoln. Uh, I appreciate the question. It's a fascinating problem. Uh, and it's a, long, it's, a, it's a complex problem, but to boil it down, uh, Douglas started out as a ferocious critic of Lincoln. Uh, to him at first, although he, he, he only learns about Lincoln really through the Lincoln-Douglas debates of 1858. And then of course, in the campaign of 1860. Initially, he saw Lincoln as a Republican moderate, an old Henry Clay Whig who became a kind of uh, moderate Republican. He was anti-slavery, but not a real abolitionist. He would, uh, he would stop the expansion of slavery, but not really eliminate it. That was his view at first. But the fascinating thing about these two incredible characters is they started out in very different places on slavery. But through 1861, 62, 63, 64, they came to the point, because of the force of war, because of the force of necessity, of circumstances, and of change, they were by late 63, 64, essentially speaking from the same script. Now, Douglas was the radical. He wasn't inside of power. He didn't have Lincoln's responsibilities. And that speech that Douglas gave at the Freedmen's Memorial, which you referred to in 1876 at its dedication, and it's, I guess the principal reason I've been advocating preserving that monument, even though it shows this godlike standing Lincoln with the kneeling slave, is that the speech Douglas gave that day all but rendered that ground sacred to me and to some of us. I'm not alone in this. It, because it's in that speech that Douglas gave us the two Lincolns. He was dead honest about the, the first Lincoln, whom he called the white man's president, uh, a man who uh, operated by the assumptions of a white man. He said, uh, my fellow white Americans, you are Abraham Lincoln's children. I and my people are only his stepchildren. And he repeated that three times. It's an amazing metaphor. But then in the second half of that speech, Douglas simply acknowledged that historically, Lincoln's caution, Lincoln's methods, and the just basic brutal circumstances of winning the war are how black people became free. He uses a, a separate refrain in the second part of that speech where he uses it three times. He says, under his rule and in due time, under his rule and in due time is how we became free. Uh, it was a ceremonial speech. He could have just done a nice, pretty talk that day in a spring day and be done with it, but he didn't. He gave the second greatest speech of his life that day. And, and Douglas, by the way, invented many different kinds of Lincolns over the last 30 years of his life, which is what everybody did. You, know, you need a Lincoln for this issue, you use that Lincoln. Um, they had a very complex relationship. They only met three times, so it wasn't a deeply personal relationship, but they had a profound relationship sort of in language, in rhetoric, and in, uh, and in growing toward the same cause. So we have time for one more brief question, a question about sin. Um, and Douglas's views on sin. Um, would he have seen a difference between individual and collective sin? Um, any oh, yes. insight on that? Oh, yes. And that, that he learned early uh, among his mentors in abolitionism, whether it was Garrison or Wendell Phillips and many others. Uh, in essence, the purpose of the American anti-slavery movement, once it really got going in the 1830s and 1840s, was to teach Americans <laughs> that this idea of personal salvation had to become a question of collective salvation, uh, of a collective confrontation with social sin, national sin. It was almost like the nationalization of sin, taking responsibility for your country's enslavement of other people and not just worrying about your own personal salvation. That was, that was essentially one of the 
arguments of all early abolitionists. Later, a lot of them take up politics, which was almost a natural sort of evolution. If you don't find a way to attack this system within the institutions of power, then where do you turn? And how long will you wait to convert the hearts you know, of millions of people? Well, Professor Blight, unfortunately, that's all we have time for this morning. We really appreciate you joining us. It's been such a treat to have you here and explain the context and content of this great speech. Those of you who are watching, if you haven't read the speech yet, I encourage you to read it. There's a video version um, going around social media in which some of Douglas's descendants are reciting it, um, some of his young descendants. And um, we also have a close reading group of the speech, um, which we have two more sessions of in July on Wednesday evenings, and I encourage you to join us for that. Professor Blight, thank you so much. Oh, Peter, thank you. It was an honor. I'd like to sit in on that close reading group, actually. You are more than welcome. I'm not saying a word. I just want to hear it. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Thank you again. Our